Hey guys, I'm back to my SOS videos. I've already done two for you. And uh, just as a review, uh, last week, it's already been over a week, we've been back from SOS, but show of shows, I picked up a lot of treasures. I mentioned that I have a couple more videos. I said three, but in fact, I got at least uh, five videos in total coming out because I got two veteran stories that I wanna bring you. I also mentioned I'm gonna go over Navy Lugers. They're all over there. That's going to be a complicated video because it's a lot of information I need to study up on a little bit before I bring it to you. Today I'm going to do an easy one because I'm just going to talk about odds and ends that I picked up. There's some interesting guns uh, starting off with this Luger, but before I do that, uh, let me give you an update on what the heck is it. I got a lot of feedback on the first item, which uh, was, well, here it is. All right, this little device, um, a lot of you got back to me. Uh, I'll, I'll note Tim uh, most of all, because he, he actually uh, communicated quite a bit. Uh, but he, he told me how to hook it up. It does fit perfectly on here on a K98. Uh, that's the perfect size. It rests right on the wood. Uh, you wrap Anyway, this, this worked out just uh, perfectly. Um, and it is, I got two answers, and I think both of them are entirely possible. One. Uh, it is a training device so that uh, when a soldier is learning how to shoot, when he looks, uh, when he sights it down, the instructor can see exactly what he might be doing wrong because when I hold this out here, I can see the sight, the reflection, I can see the sight. Now this mirror, I can find the window because the second answer was to shoot around the corner. And it works that way as well. So, so for example, let me move back here. If I'm looking out the window, I can see the window, and now I can look in this. I can see the window in here, but then I can sight right down the barrel from the rear sight to the front sight. It's very cool, actually. I can see really, you know, perfectly well, and I can hone in on an object like a car down the street. Now, the downside to this would be I'm holding it. If I pull this trigger, it's going to really pop. So I'd want to I'd want to practice a few times, but it is uh, very do doable and quite an inexpensive device. Shooting around the corner, by the way, if there's a wall here, obviously, and sticking my head instead of sticking my head around, I can look around what's at the around the corner and I can even shoot my rifle. But the idea that it's used for training, I think and absolutely I could see where the instructor could see how my eyes are um, focused or, or both eyes are closed or squinting or whatever I'm doing wrong, the instructor could use this as an instructional device. So that's the first answer to what the heck is it. I'll pop it off, comes off really easy. Now that I know what it is, I'm sure we'll put it up for sale. I have no idea what it's worth, but if you're interested, let us know. The second item was this, which is in fact somebody confirmed that the uh, German military did order lighters and they approved them for the military and they were often stamped. So uh, a couple people confirmed that yes, this is a lighter issued to the German military. Uh, cute little item. I'm sure it would work today if I put a little lighter fluid in there. I'm sure it would work. So uh, what the heck is it? Uh, will probably be a regular feature and every time I get something like this, I'll uh, get you guys to weigh in. The final one, the RZM, uh, I'm still waiting to hear about that. There's a few researchers that I'm sure will be getting back to me. But let's go to today's video on odds and ends from the show of shows. Okay, uh, this is first. This is a really cool rare gun. Uh, you're going to take a closer look and right away uh, many of you are saying, oh my gosh, that's a Black Widow. And one might think it's a Black Widow but you will be left scratching your head when you start looking uh, at more of the detail. All right, first and foremost, there's no logo on the toggle. Secondly, there's no date other than number 10. Now, number 10 turns out to be the serial number. Anybody know yet? Anybody, anybody want to shout it out? Go ahead. Number 10 here. I actually took the liberty of, let's take this out, I took the liberty of taking the screw off of this just to make it quick and easy. There's number 10 here. Okay, so number 10 on the frame, number 10 on the receiver. I'm taking the uh, side plate off, number 10 right there. There are several other parts uh, throughout the gun that have number 10 on it, so clearly this is number 10. If you've already guessed, it is a PX gun. Now, a PX gun after the war, 
Krigov put together Lugers for the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army who came over, uh, they wanted souvenirs. I've talked about this before. They mostly wanted Lugers. And so Krigov put together, I believe it was about 500 of them, but I do have a letter that explains it. Okay, here's the definitive proof. This is, by the way, the Heinrich Krigov right after the war. Uh, this is dated 1964. Um, English is a little bit broken. Uh, he he uh, basically, Harry Jones, who wrote a book on Lugers uh, way back then, back in the 60s, he specifically asked about the meaning of the KU stamp, and he goes on to say, uh, Krigoff goes on to say, Mr. Krigoff goes on to say, uh, he doesn't know any. He doesn't know anything about uh, the meaning of the KU marking. My uh, my craftsmen at the Sewell, that would be Sewell factory, assembled during six weeks until the Russians. He was in the Russian sector, and I think they came in and, and took over the factory. Uh, in his factory, from parts, they made 500 to 600 Lugers for the American soldiers. He goes on to say, I don't know the specifics of uh, what was the caliber and what was the serial ranges, but we know that the PX guns. Uh, after the war, they sold 500 to six of them to GIs, uh, and this is PX gun number 10. So it's a very exciting find. And again, this is kind of broken English, but the gist is they assembled about uh, 500 or 600 Lugers for the American GIs. Okay, now that we know what it is, it's a PX gun, let's take a look at uh, what it character, what's its characteristics are. Now, about half of the PX guns that we have handled, and we've had five or six of them, they do have the uh, Krigoff logo right here. Uh, this one does not, and it's not significant. They just used leftover parts. Uh, so for example, uh, this barrel, you can see here a crown N, which is a proof, uh, it's actually a commercial proof, and a serial number, which does not match the 10. So this is basically a DWM barrel. It was a commercial barrel. It is in nine millimeter. Uh, this gun was, uh, you can see the finish is not quite the same because they basically put it together from parts and then refinish the gun. So it's kind of a crude refinish. Uh, you can see this is shiny here, but this is dull. So again, all leftover parts. They renumbered most of the parts, but in the case of the barrel, they did not renumber it. Uh, sometimes these will be blank, sometimes they'll be military uh, barrels, but in this case, it's just a DWM barrel. Now, this is a Krigoff frame, and by the way, if I if I take the toggle off and I did that, there's a you can see the just part of a late war Krigoff proof here. Internally, inside this um, toggle, there's a Krigoff proof in here. Uh, that's the front toggle, um, and then the rear toggle. There's a Krigoff proof in there. Uh, throughout the gun, uh, there's a couple Krigoff proofs, but most of the parts are blank. Uh, so the frame, for example, I re I know it's numbered ten. Uh, this is just a standard. Um, this is a standard leftover uh, Black Widow mag, and actually that has the, uh, it has the Eagle 37 proof that, that Black Widow mags tend to have. But uh, the frame uh, number 10, what I also notice about it, it is a Krigoff frame. Uh, let me show you the differences between a Mauser frame and a Krigoff frame. And perhaps this will be your teachable moment for the day. Uh, this is a Mauser frame. This, uh, this is also from the SOS. I picked this up. It's a 1940-42 code, which is Mauser, so 1940-42 code. It is all matching numbers, including the magazine. So you see the magazine in the C block, 655 proof, 655 proof in the C block. So this is an all matching gun, 1940, that we will be adding to our website. Um, but when we look at the Mauser frame, you see what they call this front, uh, front strap has a half moon. The Krigoff, the Krigoff frame has a teardrop. See the difference? Half moon versus teardrop. So that's one difference. Also, you've heard of the Mauser hump. Hump? What hump? There's the Mauser hump, which just means there's a hump here. I, I remember reading why they did that. It had to do with the strength of the frame. Krigoff and DWM did not have the Mauser hump, so this, this is a, a Krigoff frame. This, uh, we'll call this the groove on the stock lug, and right at the top, there's a little circular pattern where they, the Dremel uh, would go in, and they would make a little circular mark and then they'd push their way through. And they all have that little circular mark and then push their way through. 
Uh, Krigoff does not have that, and it's documented in Gibson's book. If you can see in the light, there is no little circular mark um, on either side, and that's typical. I'm going to shine a light on that. That's what the typical uh, Krigoff frame looks like versus the Mauser frame. You, can, uh, you have to look closely, but there's a little circular pattern at the top of the groove. So these are the two Lugers, uh, this one pretty rare, a PX gun, and then a 1940 all matching, including the magazine. Okay, speaking of oddities and Lugers, uh, let's take a look at this gun. You can see right away the extended barrel. Uh, maybe you're trying to guess, uh, but um, let's take a closer look first. Okay, so this is a 1941, so it'd be a BYF toggle, uh, but this had the Irma. Now this was made during the war. They did have 22 caliber conversion kits, and they would use this for training. The police used them, the military used them, it saved on ammo, it was a good training device, and so they would hook up these Irma uh, conversion kits. Uh, we have sold these, you can see the Waffen stamp, and that's from the Irma factory. It was inspected and installed. Uh, this is part of it here. Uh, they removed the extractor, I think that's part of the conversion, um, because this has all been replaced. Uh, basically, again, 22 caliber. Let's take a look at the magazine. The magazine is uh, for 22 caliber long. It does have a Waffen stamp and also is numbered. Uh, so this is actually numbered to the kit um, and not matching. There's the number of the conversion kit and the magazine was swapped out at some point. So here you can see uh, what the magazine looked like. I'd like to shoot one of these. Uh, this would be ideal. So load it up with 22 long. Uh, put this in. By the way, you notice it's, it's Mauser. See the circular pattern at the top? Both sides, circular pattern at the top. Grips are kind of worn, so this was used quite a bit in training. Eagle 135 proofs, which is actually late 41. And then this was attached, and this was attached. This was uh, inserted into the entire barrel. If you take a look in here, you can see what it looks like on the inside. We drop the toggle and this prongation, uh, yes, that is a word in English. That prongation is sticking out. Looks uh, rather obvious that it's now loaded and you fire. And I'm sure this would work. Uh, we will be selling this, but it's a, a nice looking gun. I, I, would, I would take it back to its original condition, but I, I just don't have the toggle to go with this. And then certainly it wouldn't be matching. So I'll leave it like this and we will sell this as is. 22 caliber conversion kit inserted into a BYF-41 Luger. Okay, let's move on to some of my bread and butter, which are PPs and PPKs. These are all PPs. I've got three examples here. Uh, let's start with this one. Not a real beautiful gun. Uh, it's got uh, some use in corrosion, uh, but what makes it a little bit unusual is the RFV with a property number here. Somebody just asked me, um, one of the subscribers, what's the meaning of the numbers? We know this is Reich's Finance Bureau. Uh, Reich's Finance Bureau and a property number. I don't know the meaning of the property number other than they logged in the uh, guns. Uh, by property number. So that was uh, the number used by the RFV. RFV, Reich's Finance, basically they were the tax men, tax collectors, they enforced the law. Uh, they were involved in a lot of seizing of property for enemies of the states and Jewish people. They would seize their property and sell it in order to raise revenue. They are also involved in customs and duties, uh, again, collecting fees for people coming in and out taking things in and out of Germany, everybody had to pay a fee. It was just basically re raising revenue for the Third Reich. So this is not really a pristine gun, but still uh, very collectible and uh, lowers the price a little bit. It is in the proper serial range, pre-war by the way. Crown end proofs, pre-war maybe 90 degree, yes. I'm right, it's 90 degree safety, uh, which was the early style. And one other thing that comes with this, a capture paper. Not just one, not just two, but three capture papers. Yes, this man was fastidious. Let's take a look. Two of them are from the 26th of November, and it is signed by this officer named Frederick. Can't, uh, and by the way, that is, that is the same serial number. 
Then same serial number again, also signed by Frederick on the same day. So we got two copies and yet they're slightly different. So this was probably the original typed in and this was a carbon copy. And then two days later, uh, Arthur came along and said, did you get your papers? And he said, yep, well, I didn't see them. So <laughs> however it happened, um, same, same exact serial number. Ends in 874 here and ends in 874 there. Uh, this guy, Arthur, though, he wasn't as fastidious as we thought because he says the caliber is 38 caliber, and clearly this is 7.65, as most of them were. And you can see right here it said 7.65, but he recorded it as 38 caliber. Anyway, I've never seen a gun with three captured papers. I guess that's worth triple the value. Okay, this one is standard fare for us. This is just a really nice, you can see after the high polish finish, they went to this uh, transitional finish, which is kind of a duller military finish, but Waffen stamped, which means it went to the German army, almost certainly to a German officer. Rank and file carried P-38s or Lugers. Uh, officers tended to carry 30, uh, 32 caliber 7.65. You see that from the serial number, I believe this is about uh, late 42 and it is uh, Eagle end proofed, but Waffen stamp. So to a military officer and it should have the Walther banner with the 7.65 caliber. Uh, so this is just a, a really nice example that we will add to our website. And then uh, lastly, uh, deserves a little more discussion because this is uh, very unique. First of all, it's an early gun. Notice the serial number is reversed. Most of the ones that you have, if you go look at your Walther PP or PPK, you will see the serial number looks like this, right side up. But these earliest ones in the 700,000 range, that's upside down compared to others. The serial number started at seven, uh, 750,000, so 750001. Uh, in this case, it's uh, 755, which means this is about the 5,000th gun made. Um, and it was commercial, but in, in this case, it was issued to a bank. You see Panagraph slide. Uh, those of you who study this know that the Panagraph slide, uh, it means it went to a bank. And by the way, this was done at the bank arsenal after it left the factory. Um, these numbers are usually over top of the bluing. In this case, it's probably over the bluing but tarnished. I don't believe that should be under the bluing, um, but that does look all correct. Uh, numbered frame, numbered slide, and then they also came with a numbered magazine. Now, this is the correct style and it matches the gun, but it does look a little funky, doesn't it? Here's one of the earliest ones known, and so you know it must be from my collection, and so it is. Again, you see the serial number is upside down. Now this was the 137th gun made. It's a 750,000. This is added later. You can see how it was crudely done, and also the magazine, they are crudely done. Again, that was not done at the factory. It was done at the bank arsenal. Now, somebody asked, uh, the last time I did a bank gun, what do you mean a bank gun? Who in the bank? Obviously, uh, bank guards, but they also kept a gun in the safe. Um, sometimes the tellers would have them in a locked drawer. Uh, females in particular were issued uh, 22 caliber, maybe smaller. They are bank guns that are 22 caliber. Most are 7.65. Um, that's not a sexist comment, but they like the smaller guns for the female tellers, but they would be kept in the drawers or kept by a bank guard at the door. So you do see the panograph slide here and then the numbering here. So the magazine originally looked like this. Uh, just as uh, additional education for no extra charge, here is a bank gun PPK. Uh, so you see the brown bottom, same early variation. I can't read the serial number, but it looks like 764. Uh, again, very early. These were all made in 1920. Uh, this is 29, and that one is about 1930, so they're very e early. First year of production, by the way, was 29. So you can see this is a bank-numbered magazine for a PPK. So what's going on with this funkiness? Is this a secret weapon of some sort or perhaps issued to Adolf Hitler, and so they made it shaved off? No, uh, that would not be the case. In this case, here's my best guess, and it's just logic. 
These uh, finger extension bottoms are just made of uh, plastic or Bakelite. They're very brittle, so if I break one on a cement floor, uh, it will chip off. My guess is this is the original magazine. It got chipped, and so rather than leave it with a chip in the front, uh, somebody just ground it down to smooth it out, and that's how it got to look the way it does. Okay, a couple more odds and ends. Uh, these are two sour 38 inches. Um, let's take a look at these. Uh, they're a little bit unique. Okay, uh, both of these are very late war. However, this one is super late. Um, and in fact, I think after the end of the war put together, uh, it is matching. Let's do this one first. So this is a standard late war. They took the uh, general logo and narrowed it down to just one line, which says caliber 7.65. So they streamlined it quite a bit. They still have the decocker, cocker, decocker. So when it's cocked, It'll decock using this lever, so they still had that. Uh, on this side, you see the proof marks are um, Eagle N, and from the serial number, this is probably about 1944. Eagle N and Eagle N here. And one other place, if I pull the slide back, you can see the Eagle N on the barrel. And I do that just to show you that they had three proof marks on them. Uh, if we go to this one, there are no proof marks here, no proof marks on the slide. There's no proof marks on the barrel at all. Okay, so you see the patina on this one. Uh, 1944, 1945, in the factory at the end of the war. Uh, you see the zinc trigger. Uh, but also what I like about this kind of unique. So I'm guessing it was in the factory, never issued, put together from parts, and they happen to have a leftover. You guessed it. How did this get a nickel-plated magazine? Well, we could say, oh, this is a complete mistake. Somebody screwed up. But I would also say in the factory at the end, they had stuff in storage bins. They were getting rid of everything at the time. And this was probably made at some point. They did have a few presentation guns, very few presentation guns, very rare to find a nickel-plated sour. That, um, the SS marking, by the way, that logo is a very early logo. So this is an early presentation piece. But again, at the fa in the factory at the end, this goes like this, it's just, it's just a unique piece. So I thought I'd share it with you. Okay, the last of the odds and ends. I have three uh, right here. There's a fourth somewhere. I think it actually is being photographed, but uh, what I'm gonna call uh, unique guns because the first one is, uh, it's pictured here. It's a French unique. When the German army occupied France, they took over all the production plants and the French unique factory was one of them. And the inspector used an eagle 251 stamp. Uh, here's a second and third French gun. Let's take a look at these. This uh, we refer to as a uh, French Sacum. Uh, goes from the initials S-A-C-M, French Sacum. And you can see here that it also has the same inspector, Eagle 251. And we've sold quite a few of the French Sackums. These are unique. You can't really tell it with this one. Here's a picture of one we sold earlier. You can see how black it looks, and it's because they used a black anodized paint. Uh, that didn't hold up real well, and so many of them look more like this, where it's, uh, the paint has been removed uh, for the most part, but it's the Eagle uh, 251 stamp. Also, one other French pistol, the uh, French MAB. Now, that's not a paint store. But the, those of you outside of the United States, we have MAB paints, uh, French MAB, uh, and that's the model D. And there is a 251 proof right here. So that's the MAB, the SACM, and the Unique, all with the um, same inspector proof. Now, the inspector oversaw the inspectors in each factory. Uh, and the same thing happened in the United States. These guys were on the road, they were overseeing, and they went from plant to plant. But obviously, if he was gone for a week, uh, they didn't want the, the uh, factory to stand still. So people inspected using his stamp, but he would just come in and do spot checks. Um, and he also must have ri ridden the rails. He rode the rails in uh, southern France, France, and all the way down into Spain, because we see here is a um, Asta 300, a Spanish contract gun, and they also have an Astra 600. You can see one here. Uh, 600 is in nine millimeter. Uh, the Astra 300 does come in nine millimeter. This one is nine millimeter, but they also made a 
65, which I believe was a Luftwaffe contract, but not sure. And the same proof you will see right on what we call the tang of the gun, and that is uh, Eagle 251. So these are all examples of guns that were inspected by the same in inspector, at least overseen by inspectors in each plant by whoever was the man who was designated with the Eagle 251 stamp. Okay, thanks for watching. That was my odds and ends video. I hope that you uh, at least learned something. And uh, the next one I have coming up is the Navy video. That's gonna be a lot of work. I'm gonna do a little bit of studying, but I have some really cool Navy Lugers and other Navy guns uh, issued from World War I and World War II that I picked up at the show of shows. So stay tuned.